Today we're asking the question, why did Jesus rise? Why did he rise? And it's the last stop on our road to the resurrection over the last many weeks now. So why did Jesus rise? Where are we? Let's think about the location for a moment. Many of you may have seen a picture like this, which is of uh, what's traditionally the site of Golgotha, the place of the skull. And it's said that there's sort of the face of a skull there in the rock formation. And so many people thought for a long time, that's where Jesus was crucified uh, and uh, buried nearby. But actually, that's not the right site. It doesn't fit with the rest of the geography and what we know about Jerusalem at the time. What did the tomb look like? Um, there is a tomb which is claimed to be or said to be the tomb of Jesus. It's not the, the, the right one because it's not constructed at the right time. But there are many tombs from the first century in the Jerusalem area. This is one. This is actually one of the tombs for Herod, King Herod and his family. So that's a typical tomb from the first century. You can see there, let's see if I can make this work. You can see this is a, there's a right round stone, right? So it would have been rolled across there and into a groove, preventing anybody from getting in. So that's a very typical uh, uh, tomb of the time. And this is um, a, a modern construction of a first century tomb that may have been quite like the one that Jesus was buried in. So it would have looked something like that. And I put that up, not because it's necessarily exactly like that, but because it might help us to get into the stories that we're looking at, that you can visualize Mary, the angel, the other disciples, or uh, anybody that was involved with these resurrection appearances, especially those around the tomb. So that's something like what it looked uh, like. Um, I'm not going to go into this a lot right now because I don't want to make the focus of this sermon, did he rise, but more why. But the did he rise is important. And I have put on the Watford word some of the what's called apologetic, in other words, reasons for believing in the resurrection. And there are some very good reasons, and I've only put a few on that sheet. And I'll just very briefly mention some now in case they're helpful to settle us into confidence of the resurrection before we look at the meaning of it. The first reason I think is uh, gives evidence of the truth of the story is that the first witnesses were women. And you, we might not think in our culture that's particularly significant. But in the first century, the testimony of women was discounted. So, for example, women were not permitted to give testimony in a court of law. Sorry. Uh, ladies here, I apologize for our blind uh, forebears or something, but it was a different culture, a different time. And in those times, women couldn't give testimony. So the women being the first people to witness and give testimony to the empty tomb would make no sense if you were making the story up. If you were making the story up, you'd have men be the first witnesses. You'd never choose women. And yet we have women. And indeed, if you were making the story up and women were the first witnesses, you'd write them out of the story. You pretend it wasn't women. You see what I'm saying? And so that gives credibility to this story. It's the wrong way to do it if you're trying to prove something um, uh, that isn't actually true. The second question is, was the body of Jesus a ghost? Was it his appearance, a ghostly appearance? Um, some people think that people of the first century couldn't tell the difference between ghosts and real people. I think that's typical arrogance of one generation looking back at another. Why do we think we're so super intelligent that we think we could tell the difference, and 2,000 years ago, they couldn't. They knew the difference between a ghost and a real person. Do you remember that the disciples once thought they saw a ghost when Jesus was walking on the water? Remember that? They thought it was a ghost, but then Jesus comes and gets in the boat, and they think, they realize, oh, no, it's not a ghost. It is actually Jesus. Are you with me? They knew the difference, and uh, people do still today, and they did then. Uh, of course, this supposed ghost uh, not only um, uh, uh, shows Thomas his wounds and asks him to put his hands into the wounds, which are in his body, not in a ghostly sense, and he also asks for food to eat, and ghosts don't eat, at least that's not my understanding. Of course, uh, some of you may remember the sermon that Stefan gave a few weeks ago, which mentions ghosts. So if you have a particular interest, go to the ghost expert uh, <laughs> sitting uh, over here. Uh, another question. Uh, was the tomb occupied? Perhaps the disciples and the women went to the wrong tomb and they went, you know, there was an actual tomb where the body of Jesus still is. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> quite right. Uh, yeah. I don't mind hecklers who laugh. Um, no, no, quite. I mean, it doesn't make any sense because if the, the, these people are claiming that Jesus has risen from the dead and you know because you're the Roman authorities where the tomb is and that there's a dead body in it, 
Well, you can stop this immediately by just going to that tomb, taking a stone away and saying, there he is. But they didn't do that. And they didn't do that because they knew the tomb was empty. Because the emptiness of the tomb doesn't prove the resurrection, but it does prove there is no body in a tomb. So the tomb uh, was not occupied any longer. Did the disciples steal the body or somebody else? Grave robbery was a capital offense. It, they found an inscription in, inscription in Nazareth uh, from the first century where Caesar says, if anybody robs a tomb, then they will die. So it's a very serious thing to do. And I cannot imagine that why the disciples would do that since they were terrified enough to run away at the beginning of all of the shenanigans that went on here. Um, the sermons, the first century sermons are all about the resurrection. They're not about Jesus, just he died. They're about he rose and he lives. Why are you going to preach something which is so ridiculous? Unless it's true. I mean, you'd preach some other message if it wasn't true, right? But if, but if it's, if, that's the reason you preach that message. And that's the message that got them in trouble. And they're preaching something that they believe to be true. And if anybody knew it was true, it was the first disciples. And lastly, briefly, if he didn't rise from the dead, how do we explain all this? How do we explain 2,000 years of Christian history? How do we explain the emergence of the early church under persecution, threat of death and execution, often persecuted, preaching a message that made no sense to Romans, made no sense to Jews, made no sense to anybody except those who'd seen the risen Jesus? How do you explain that? There's been no movement in history. There hasn't been. That has been founded and spread and endured in this way, except by military conquest or some other kind of conquest that's violent in some sense, economic or military. Christianity was founded on peaceable terms by a non-resistance peaceable movement of people who went to their deaths proclaiming that they had seen the risen Lord. I don't know, even if none of these other things uh, uh, hold water, you still have to account for how did Christianity begin and why is it endured for 2,000 years? So did he rise from the dead? I don't think there's any other rational explanation. I haven't found one. I haven't heard one. It's the only explanation for the things that we, put, we can see around us and for what's happened over these thousands of years to me that makes any sense. So having said that, uh, let's uh, go and think a bit more about what's happening in Mark 16. In Mark 16, we have our final section of the Gospel of Mark we've been going through. The Sabbath is over. They're going there very early in the mornings on the first day of the week. So uh, that's about 5 a.m. roughly about in that time. So it's very early. They're going there. They are brave. They're very brave to go there because Jesus has just been crucified as a criminal. And they're going to associate themselves with him. They find that the, two, the, the, stone, so the stone is a problem for them. They, they worry about it. Who will roll the stone away? That stone was probably five or six feet tall, so maybe as tall as me, and it would have weighed several hundred pounds. And of course, the friction of it against the stone wall would make it even harder to move. It's not like it was made of smooth material. So it's understandable why they think it's going to be very difficult for them. They come across this young man, the, tomb having, the, the stone having been rolled away. The young man is in there, dressed in a white robe. Other accounts call these people angels, probably an angel, dressed in white to represent that he's a representative of the heavenlies. So he's not of this world. That's why he's dressed in white. And interestingly, he's sitting on the right side. And anybody who sat on the right side is sitting in the place of authority or associated with authority. So Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. The kings of the Old Testament who sat at their right hand were sort of their deputy and someone who could speak for them with authority. And so this signifies that this person is speaking with the authority of God the Father. And he's there to reassure them. Don't be alarmed, he said. No, I mean, <laughs> easy words to say. Uh, I know, I'm sure they were very alarmed, not knowing what on earth is going on. You're looking for Jesus. He was crucified, but he has risen. He's not here, as is blindingly obvious, I suppose, at that point. Where, where is he? See the place they laid him. Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going to Galilee ahead of you. You'll find him there. Uh, what does this signify? Firstly, I think it signifies forgiveness. It signifies forgiveness because he's... The, the angel wouldn't say go to the disciples unless Jesus was going to forgive them for running away and deserting him. And specifically, he mentions Peter. And I think it's a lovely touch. And I suspect that it gives further evidence that this gospel was Peter's gospel dictated to Mark, which a lot of people think, and Papias, and a first, an early Christian historian uh, said this, and I think it's very likely. That's, I think it's a Peter recollection right there. He remembered me by name. And why Peter so significantly? Because Jesus, Peter called down curses on himself 
to deny that he ever knew Jesus. So he went even further than the rest of the disciples. And God wants Peter to know there's hope for you yet. And I love that because you and I, if we've been following Jesus for a while, have had some experiences where we would feel like we'd gone too far in sin for God to have us back. And God says, no, 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 no. If I can have Peter back, believe me, I can have you back. And I want you back. And that's what he's saying there to Peter. And we had the beginning of the Christian mission because this is the first time anybody is told after the resurrection to go. Go tell his disciples. It's the beginning of the mission uh, right here. So how does Mark's gospel end? Doesn't it end a bit strangely? It doesn't end like the other gospels. And some of you will have extra text in your Bibles about other endings. Those endings are later. They're probably not original. In fact, they're almost certainly not original. doesn't mean that they're not true or accurate, but they almost certainly weren't written by Mark or by somebody at that point. What, what Mark wrote almost certainly ends there in verse 8. And it ends on a bit of a cliffhanger. They're trembling, bewildered. They run away. They don't tell anybody. They're afraid. That's an interesting ending. It leaves you with questions, doesn't it? So we end Mark's gospel with a mixture of fear and hope. A lot of the Christian life is like that. It's a mixture. We've got inaction. They're not telling anybody, but we've got action as well. We've got the male disciples absent, and we've got the female disciples silent, at least at this point. But the focus of the passage is that heaven has spoken. By raising Christ from the dead and by sending the angel to say this is what has happened, heaven has spoken and declared that Jesus, and, and Jesus as usual, we see is one step ahead of the rest of his followers. He's going on ahead of them. He's ready, preparing for what comes next. And what comes next, that future, is going to involve the disciples, male and female, once they get their act together. And there's a future for all of us if we kind of get our spiritual act together in light of the power of the resurrection. So a couple of points, and then we'll be taking some bread and wine in a little while. What does it mean that he rose from the dead? What does the resurrection mean? First thing it means is that Jesus lives to help us. He lives to help you and me. He doesn't just live to prove that he has power over sin, death, and the grave, which is true. But he carries on living in the heavenlies, but living to help us. Firstly, by giving us new life. And secondly, by interceding for us. He gives us new life. I'm going to jump around in a few scriptures here to hope we'll illustrate this. Paul says this to a group of Christians in Rome. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised, raised here, we've got the resurrection, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. God's desire is for us to have a new life. And it begins now in just the same way as it began on earth for Jesus. His new life began on earth. Our life begins on earth, continues forever, but begins here. For, it says, if we have been united with him in a death like this, what's he talking about? In a baptism, a burial in baptism. If we've been united with him in that kind of death, we will certainly, and I love that verse, this verse five, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We have hope for the future and we have a life that begins now. We have confidence in this new life because we've been baptized into the death of Christ and that happens in our baptism in water because that's what the word baptism means. It's in immersion in water. There's a baptistry under this stage, right? It's those of us who've encountered Christ in that kind of baptism that have this new life. And if that's not something you've had a chance to experience, I encourage you to look into that. Because if you want that new life, the life that begins now and never perishes, then this is how you get it. It's a wonderful promise. We have that new life and we live into it. Uh, interesting what Paul says to Timothy here. In chapter 6, he says, You man of God, O Timothy, Flee from all this. So we've been talking about sin earlier and worldliness. Flee from that and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. A lot of those are sort of fruit of the Spirit, aren't they? Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called 
when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Take hold of the eternal life. In other words, take hold of it now. He's not saying wait for the eternal life you're going to receive. He's saying take hold of it now, live it. That's why he's talking about it in the context of sin and righteousness, in the context of the, uh, the fruit of, of, uh, of the Spirit, is you live this now. This is your eternal life now. Is living differently now by the power of the Spirit. And this is what marks out a Christian from the world. It's not that they come into a building on a Sunday morning. It's not that they happen to pray occasionally. What marks out a Christian from the rest of the world is that we live the eternal life now. We live differently now. We have a, what you might call, I like to call, a beatitudinal approach to life. That we live the beatitudes. That we are merciful. Uh, that we are pure of heart. That we are peacemakers and so on. This is the new life made possible by, by what Christ has done by rising from the dead and giving us his, sharing with us his new life, drawing us into his new life. That's what helps us to live the Beatitudes. That's what helps us to live what you could call the kingdom life, the fruit of the Spirit. So he gives us new life and he also intercedes for us. Intercede is an interesting uh, word. It's not one we tend to use very much. What does it mean? Hebrews 7. Talking about here comparing Jesus as a superior priest to the old covenant priest. That's the context of what's going on here. And he says to a lot of those priests, uh, but Jesus is different in verse 24 because Jesus lives forever. There are a lot of priests in the Old Testament, but there's only one priest for us, and that's Jesus. And we only need one because he doesn't die and have to keep passing on his chief priesthood to somebody else because he lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. He's able to save completely those who come to. God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. He lives to intercede for you and I. So he's not disappeared off to heaven and left us for a while to figure it out. He's interceding for you and I. Now, what does that mean? I haven't got time to dig into all of that right now, but I think it means at least two things. I think firstly, it means that he intercedes for us that the Father will continue to view us in the same way that the Father views his son, Jesus. That as he sees his son as pure and holy, and sinless. Jesus intercedes for us in some way to say, Father, look at my followers in the same way. They are, yes, they're, they're a bit messed up down here on earth for a while. Yeah, they're struggling. Yeah, but remember, my blood covers them. My broken body covers them. My new life is theirs. Like, if you're going to accept me, Father, you've got to accept them. And I sometimes think, Father, you know, God looks at me or others of us and thinks, do I have to? I don't know. They're a bit messed up. Jesus says, yeah, I know, but that's why you sent me, remember? That's why I went. And so as you look at me, look at them. I think there's some kind of interceding in that sense. It seems to fit with the whole idea of priesthood. But I think there's also the interceding of prayer. It's through Christ that our prayers get to the Father. It's through him. Jesus told us to pray in his name. And there's some kind of interceding that's going on where your prayers and mine land in the ears of God the Father because of Christ. It's like he provides a channel. It's like he provides the right um, email address um, or a post box or something. I don't know. The illustrations won't, won't be adequate. But there's something there that gives us the reason we have confidence that the Father hears our prayers is not because our prayers are perfect. <laughs> I've never heard one. I don't think I've ever uttered one. No, it's not because our prayers are perfect or formulated in the right way or because we are particularly holy. The reason our prayers get heard is because Jesus lives to, in an ongoing way, intercede for you and me. I think that's amazing. As it says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it God who justifies? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. Jesus is on your side. That's the basic message. Is for you, never against you, always willing to help. Whatever's going on, he's there. Because of that, we have hope, we have life. So Jesus lives to help. 
He also lives to love. I'm going to go backward to the resurrection accounts for a moment here. Because one of the things I find perplexing a little bit about the resurrection accounts is that they are not, Jesus doesn't conduct himself in the way I think I would have. And certainly not in the way that somebody would who was plotting, uh, writing a script for a Hollywood movie. If you were writing a script, I don't think it would work this way. And I think it's deliberately this strange way to remind us that the resurrection is about God's connection with us, not about just some grand event, as grand as it surely is. So let me explain what I mean. First of all, we see an awful lot of confusion around the resurrection. The passage we read earlier in Mark 16, uh, they don't know who's going to roll the stone away. Stone away. They're told don't be alarmed. Why? Because they're alarmed. I mean, they're afraid. They are after, even after they've heard the message, they are trembling and bewildered. They run away. They don't say anything, and they're afraid. This is an interesting reaction to the best news that's ever occurred in human history, right? But that's the reality. Or on the road to Emmaus, we won't have time for the whole story here, but you may know that two of the disciples of Jesus were walking out of Jerusalem towards a place called Emmaus, the day of the resurrection, and one of Jesus' first appearances is to appear with them, walk along with them, and ask them, what's been going on recently? <laughs> and they are stunned that he's, what, what do you mean? I mean, it would be a bit like, uh, an alien coming in here and saying, uh, anything been going on the last two years? And we would know exactly what to talk to him about or her about, right? But the phrase there tells us where they were, they were at. He's, they're explaining the chief priest, the rulers, handed him, the one we thought was Messiah, to be sentenced to death. They crucified him. But we had hoped. We had hoped. He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. They're disappointed. They're confused. They don't know what's going on. It's interesting. And then in John's gospel, a slightly longer passage here, when Mary encounters Jesus in the garden, she's just crying all the time. I mean, there's a lot of weeping and grief. She stands outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, so it's more than just you know a little trickle of a tear. I mean, this is proper on, full-on crying. She bends over to look into the tomb. There's two angels there, uh, one of the head, one of the foot. They ask her, woman, why are you crying? She's still crying. They've taken my Lord away. I don't know where they put him. She turns around. Jesus is there. He doesn't realize it's him. He asks her, woman, why are you crying? I mean, she's still crying. Uh, who are you looking for? I'm thinking it was a gardener. If you've taken him away, I'll go get him. Jesus says, Mary. Uh, turns towards him, cries out, Rabboni, teacher. She, he says, don't hold on to me. I, I've not yet ascended. Go to my brothers, tell them I am ascending uh, to my God and your God. She goes to the disciples. I've seen the Lord. Looks like she's not crying anymore. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I mean, she's crying outside the tomb. She's crying inside the tomb. She's crying outside the tomb again. She's, there's a lot of weeping going on. And I'm not, not uh, blaming her or thinking that's a wrong thing to do. But it's more this, the way that Jesus and these two angels deal with her is not harsh. It's not like, gosh, didn't you believe I said I was going to rise from the dead. What's wrong with you, woman? That's not the attitude Jesus takes. It's not the attitude the, 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 the angels take. They're not rebuking her. They're gentle with her, giving her facts, giving her reassurance. And Jesus just says, he just says, Mary, it's highly personal. The resurrection is personal for you and me. It's about our new lives, and it's about the love of Jesus for us. What would I have done if I'd been Jesus, if I'd been writing the script? I'd have come out of the tomb in a blaze of glory, first of all. I'd have marched into Jerusalem. I'd have knocked on Pilate's door. I'd have said, hi, Pilate, it's me. I'm back. You were wrong. You should have listened to your wife. <laughs> I would then have gone to the high priest and said, hey, you were wrong. It is me. I am the Messiah. You got the wrong end of the stick. You better rethink things before God's judgment comes. I'd have gone to the Sanhedrin and got them together and said, hey, it's me. I, you got it all wrong. I'd have gone into the temple, right? I'd have gone into the temple and gone up to the where the veil is that was torn in two and said, yep, that was all about me. It's all over in here. Might as well pack up and go home, priests. Might as well just put all this on one side. A new sheriff is in town. <laughs> 
I'd have gone to Herod and said, um, you think you're king, right? Actually, I really am the king. And then I'd have gone to the disciples and I'd have said, I told you. <laughs> Weren't you listening? I'd have gone to my family, especially my brothers, who it says in the Gospels didn't believe in him. And I said, brothers, I'm the eldest. You're all on punishment duty for the next seven weeks. Get your act together. You should have believed in me. I might forgive you. I don't know all the things I would do, but that kind of triumphal and almost revenge narrative is something that the world understands. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't condemn anybody. He's gentle. He's gentle for the, with the confused. He's gentle with the disappointed. He's gentle with the grief-ridden and those in pain. Jesus would rather hang around a crying woman than he would do anything else at this point. He would rather go for a walk with two of his friends than do anything else at this time. Jesus' new life is used to love people. It's not for personal impact or political glory. And our lives are to mirror that. Our new lives in Christ are to mirror the gentleness of Jesus. What is my new life for? It's to love difficult people in difficult situations. That's your life if you're a Christian. With the love and the power of Christ and the new life you've been given, your life is to love difficult people in difficult situations. And I say difficult because it's easy to love the undifficult and it's easy to love people when things aren't difficult. But the love of Christ is what stands out. that gives us the strength to love difficult people in difficult situations. Jesus meets us where we are to help us with what we need. What do you need today? What strength do you need today? Jesus will meet you there. He doesn't demand you travel somewhere else. He'll come and meet you. Like he met Mary outside the tomb, like he met the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he'll meet you where you are. I believe that the resurrection of Jesus is a certainty. I believe we have his life. I believe he intercedes for us. I believe he's with us in our grief and our pain and our confusion. I believe he meets us wherever we are, in the garden, on the road, in the home, anywhere. He meets us in our fragility with his gentleness. And I feel fragile more than I would like to admit. But he meets us in our fragility with his gentleness. And that's one of the reasons we take the bread and wine, is to remind us of this new life and of what Christ has done for us. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, people like you and I. For this reason, he had to be made like them, like you and I, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. He's here to help you and me today. Before we take bread and wine, Leon's going to come up and, uh, and pray for us and pray in gratitude for a resurrected Christ, a Christ who helps, a Christ who intercedes, a Christ who is gentle and will meet you and me wherever our need is.